turn on my mic, I bet you can hear me, huh? No, just because you've done this for 20 years doesn't mean you know what you're doing, okay? So, so uh, good morning, everybody. Good to see you. And uh, welcome to Rock Hills. We are starting a brand new series today called Good in Tension. Has anybody out there ever experienced a little tension in your life? Anyone? Anyone? Well, I think this is going to be relatable to you then. I think it may be helpful. The series we're going to be talking about for the next many weeks um, is timely. I really believe it's timely. And uh, so before we jump in, I want to welcome everybody watching online. I hope you're doing good, whoever you are, wherever you are. Thanks for tuning in. And if you're one of our soldiers, our servicemen and women, we love you so much. And we're glad that you're tuning in with us. Everybody in person, would you give it up? Share and show the love. Give it up for those watching online. Hope you guys are doing great. And I also want to just uh, do a little celebrating. Can we do that today? Can we just start off with some celebration, everybody, before we jump into our series? Last week, we wrapped up a series we've been in called Crazy Faith, everyone. Crazy. We said it's only crazy until it happens. And, uh, and that's, well, that can be true in other things in life, but it needs to be true with faith. And um, we take steps of faith. And so I just want to celebrate as we start today. that you all did that. You all did that. And so we, I mean, we asked everybody that calls Rock Hills Church their home. Everybody that's a follower of Jesus and calls this church their home church. Now let's take some steps of crazy faith. And you guys did it. That's amazing. You asked Jesus, Jesus, what do you want me to do? You prayed about it. You listened. You obeyed. You trusted him. I can't even get my kids to do what I tell them to do. But you guys are. So that's, that's just exciting. And, uh, and so I just want to celebrate some of the amazing things that happened from last week. And uh, let me try to explain it so it makes sense to everybody. Because I know some of you may be new today. And so we did a series that's talking about not only... We want to take steps of faith of trusting in God for God to do what only he can do. And, uh, and our role is to do what we can do, right? And that's when a miracle takes place. Um, and so uh, there's something that I, this is what I call it. We have something called a regular tithes and offering. That's just what I call it. Because every week we have people come prepared to give, trusting God with their finances. And that's how we do what we do. And we do that every week. I call that the, the regular tithe and offering, okay? So, so keep that in mind. But then we are also doing the making room offering. And if you don't know what that is, we we're talking about, man, above and beyond our regular tithes and offering. Let's take a step of crazy faith together and see what God would do in the realm of making room for more people to find and follow Jesus. And then how that practically plays out is we're going to remove that wall, everybody. That's happen. That's going to happen. And we're going to double our space. And because uh, you may not know this, but right next door over there to your right is a room that looks just like this one. So we're going we're gonna to literally make room in this room and double this room. And then when we do that, we, we want to renovate it and update it to make it most effective uh, as we can. So all that to say, so last week we encouraged people to take your step. Uh, inconsistent giving, and then we ask people to pray and ask Jesus, what do you want me to do for making room? Okay, all that to say, I'm so excited to let you guys know that in our regular tithes and offering, we had the highest regular tithe and offering that we've ever had in the history of Rock Hills Church last week, and uh, so that's really, really cool. And, uh, and then, but what makes that amazing to me is in addition to that, we also had the largest kind of special offering, making room offering that we've ever had in the history of our church as well. Like the, we did uh, several things along the way, but, but we've only done uh, several things in the realm of like taking an offering in addition to a regular offering, uh, tithes and offering. And, and so one was Project Rescue, that incredible organization that you guys were a part of. And I don't know if you remember that. It was like a one-time Sunday thing. You guys gave $46,000 to that, which is incredible. But I say that to say this. So not only was it our largest regular tithes and offering last Sunday, but you all, so awesome. Y'all, so far, $235,000 has come in for making room offerings so far. So would you just thank Jesus for that? Man, even if you're new, you're like, good job, man. <laughs> good on you. That's awesome. So that's just exciting, everybody. It's just exciting. And that positions us to get moving forward on this project and to make it what, what we believe God wants to make it. And, uh, and it's way more than removing a wall, right? We've said that a lot. It's... it's uh, we want to remove the walls of selfishness and greed and loneliness and addiction and spiritual emptiness. They've got a lot of walls that need to come down by the grace of God. And, uh, but we're going to do that together. So I'm so proud of you. That's how I wanted to start. I want to say I'm proud of you for taking steps. I believe with all my heart, you guys have hungry hearts. And I believe that this is a church who wants to hear God's word. You want to grow in faith. You want to make a difference. And I will tell you. It is a privilege to pastor a generous church, right? So, so I, I, I'll do whatever God wants me to do, but I really don't want to pastor a church that's stingy. Okay, so, so I'm grateful that we want to make a difference and t together. One of the things that I think is massive that I also want to celebrate 
is uh, I think the biggest step um, is when somebody decides to take the first step of giving for the first time. Because I believe after you take that step, God's going to prove himself your provider. And it doesn't necessarily get easier. You just get more faith-filled. But that first step's a doozy, okay? And uh, there were 20 people, plus 20 plus people last week that made the decision to give for the very first time. So if that's you, I just want to say that's awesome. And we're with you. And thanks for trusting in the Lord. And, and one person, um, uh, like, literally did what we were praying about that. Because my pastor heart, like, if you're new, just checking out faith and, man, consider something to consider but if you're on the mission with this a pastor's heart is that man i know everybody's step is different that's between you and jesus but my heart is that we would all just go in all together like we would all play our part because what i know is what we need to pull off what god wants us to pull off is right here in this house but it will take all of us trusting all of god and uh, and so this one person for the first time gave consistently but then in addition to that they gave towards the making room offering and they put a little note next to what they gave. And I just want to read it because I think it's amazing. And this person said, I'm making my first step of trusting God in my finances. But then with the making room gift they gave, they said this, I don't know exactly what the Lord's plan is for my life. Can anybody relate to that? Anybody? Let's just, I just want you to know if that was you. A lot of people in here relate. I don't exactly know what God's plan is for my life. But they said this, I want to make room for him though. I want to make room for him to work in my life and I surrender to him. It's just awesome. And it's amazing when we just take steps of faith and uh, we pray, we listen, we obey, and then we get to see what God's going to do. So, um, man, this has been a year as a church. I think we need to continue to know this. Like God is doing amazing things. Like we've had more people make a decision to follow Jesus this year than ever before in our nine plus year history. We've had 227 people so far say, I want to I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. And then, y'all, we've had 207 people go public with that faith and get water baptized, which is amazing. And uh, next week, we're going to baptize some more, okay? And uh, just exciting. So I want to share the timeline of what this is going to look like. Because if you were wondering, are we going to keep meeting in here while they take down the wall? No. The answer is no. And uh, that would be dangerous and probably illegal. Okay, so, um, but while, the, how many of you are grateful that we meet in a movie theater that has multiple theater options to meet in while we, yeah, me too. So we literally... Um, after next Sunday and the Sunday after that, so October 20th and the 27th, we'll meet in here. I don't want to confuse anybody, and we'll let you know so you don't wander around the building lost. Okay, we're going to let you know. This is coming up. And, uh, but on November the 3rd, we're going to relocate. And if you go out that door and go left, and that'll be south. If you go south to the end of the hallway, there are two rooms we're going to meet in for three months while they renovate and update this room. Are you with me? And then everybody, when they finish it, we're going to come back in here, and this will be our new room. Double side and update. It's going to be awesome. And we, our prayer is that we have that day on Super Bowl Sunday, February 9th, when the Chiefs three peak. Can I get an amen in Jesus' name? Come on. That's good. Some of you are like 207 people got baptized. Three peak Chiefs in Jesus' name. Yeah, wow, wow. That's good. Cool. All right. All right. By this time, I've done three services. So who knows what I may or may not say today? And if you want to have a really good time, you come to the fourth one. And by the way, if you want a little elbow room, 8 and 1230, okay? I'm just throwing that out there, okay? All right, so we are starting a brand new series called Good Intention. And I'm, be, I, I'm not trying to be uh, sneaky or cute. Uh, well, I failed at that a long time ago. But I want to be clear, and I want to be, bring clarity. There, there, this is very strategic, okay? For months, for months, I've been looking forward to this series because it's strategic in time because I believe it's going to be relatable to the time in which we're in. And yes, because the election is coming, if you're wondering, but not just because of that. And the times in which we live, I think it's a good thing for us to talk about the title of this series really describes it well, Good Intention. So I'd like to tell you I came up with that title because I think it's pretty awesome, but I didn't. So usually if things are, are cool and creative, that means I got them from somebody else. Okay, so my brother-in-law wrote a book called Good Intentions. Really good book. And he talks about in life, you know, you hear the word balance. Anybody ever heard you got to have balance? And that makes me want to throw up my mouth a little bit because I'm like, you keep telling me to find something I ain't ever found. I'll just be honest with you. Because in life, I mean, the reality is if you're walking a tightrope, then it's not that you have perfect balance because you're so skillful. It's really that you have learned to constantly adjust and recalculate with the tensions you're experiencing. And this book is all about that. Like, how do you live with a healthy tension because you're never going to remove tensions in life? 
I mean, that, that just in itself is worth the price of admission today, okay? Hopefully that's soup for your soul. Because he talks about how, how we have healthy tension in his book. He talks about between things like focus and flexibility. Like, oh, that's real. How do we have, like, healthy tension between, like, running hard in life and rest? How do we have a healthy tension between, like, being candid but also kind? How are we confident and humble? You know, so, so really good things. But as I read that, I thought, what a great title to a sermon series about the book of Daniel. Because the book of Daniel, which is what we're going to be doing, and we're going to go through it together, the book of Daniel is all about how do you and I live a healthy tension of a life of faith? Let me say it this way. How do you and I as followers of Jesus live godly lives in an ungodly, ungodly culture? How do we do that? How do we stand firm in our faith and at the same time love people well and not lose our influence in culture? A culture that's already compromised, that's ungodly. So unless you're just living under a rock and you showed up today, this is the times in which we're in, everybody. How do we as followers of Jesus stand firm in, our, firm in our faith, but at the same time love well? And that is exactly what this series is going to be about. And I don't believe there's a better story in all of the Bible except for Jesus himself and the Gospels that shows a tangible illustration of what it looks like to stand firm in your faith and God's word and love people well and yet still influence a culture where God strategically puts you in it. And so that's what we're going to talk about Today, Let me give a little context in the book of Daniel that we're going to be in for some weeks to come. And uh, first, it's good to know that Daniel was written about 600 some years before Jesus. Uh, the book itself is found in the Old Testament. It is half prophecy and half history, which is unique because there's not many books in the Old Testament that are both prophecy and history. They're either one or the other. And uh, But Daniel, I believe that's purposed because... There's amazing stories, by the way. I mean, we're going to look at some amazing stories in Daniel. And as we do, it's not just history with amazing stories. It's also prophecy. Some of the prophecy took place in Daniel's time, but some of it hasn't taken place yet. And I believe that it is an illustration for us of real people who had real lives on a real journey to help us understand that it wasn't just Daniel. It's a challenge for generations to come, and it can actually be a playbook for you and I on how we stand firm in our faith and love people well and not lose influence at the same time. So that's why we're going through Daniel, all right? So let's start chapter 1, verse 1. Here's what it says. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, who's the king of Babylon, which is like in modern-day Iraq, um, came to Jerusalem, and he besieged it. He's going he's gonna to overthrow it. In verse 2, and the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Now that's really important foundation to start off. Like who delivered who delivered the Israel, the Hebrew people to the king of Babylon? The Lord. So you just got to know this is the Lord's plan. The Lord allowed them to be overtaken. Why? Because if you look at the history, prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet kept telling God's people, if you continue to go your own way and not God's way, God is going to judge you. And the reason he allowed it to happen is that so that in hopes it would bring their hard hearts back to trust in him. Because they had it for a long time. So you just got to know as we look at this story, the truth is, is that this is God delivered them. And then it says, along with some of the articles from the temple of God, these he, being Nebuchadnezzar, carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia, and he put in the treasure house of his God. What a mockery. Like if your God's really the one true God, like he wouldn't allow this and take all your stuff to worship him to another temple for another God. Verse 3, then the king ordered Ashpenaz, and we're going to talk quite a bit about Ashpenaz today. The king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility. And this was customary. So as the king Nebuchadnezzar would, would take over other nations and other people groups, uh, he would kind of pick the cream of the crop, the best of the best, and then he would indoctrinate them and take them through like a three-year school program where they would forget the ways of their culture and learn the ways of the Babylonian culture because then he would use those people in like civic duty within his government to help out his own kingship. So this was customary. This wasn't anything out of the ordinary. So he does the same thing with Israelites. So the king serviced some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility, verse 4, young men without any physical defect, 
Now, we're handsome, so I'd be out. I wouldn't have made the cream of crop, apparently, but, but these guys did. So young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand. So they were wise, they were the best in their class, and they were qualified to serve in the king's palace. And then Ashpenaz, the king's court officer, he was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. That was very purpose, because they want to get God out of them and get the Babylonian culture in them, so they indoctrinate them in a three-year training program. And scholars say that Daniel and his three friends were likely 15 to 16 years old when this took place. Verse 5, and Then the king, he assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. And they were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. And so basically what he's doing now is not just new books, new, new learning, new language, new thoughts. Not only that, but now he's going to really go right into their core beliefs. And he's going to force them to eat from the king's table as opposed to the Hebrew dietary kosher law. They're going to have to give that up. And all of this was a part of getting God out of them and putting the gods of the Babylonian culture, the false gods, into them. And it was all about getting a different culture inside of them. And in verse 6, it says, Among those who were chosen were some from Judah. And this is where we find Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And so what I want to talk about before we jump into the rest of the story is that this is, just a, this is a historical real story that took place, and it was very purposed to take the best of the best and indoctrinate them and so that they can be helpful service in the king's court. But let me just tell you, in life, in which the life, I believe right now, there's what we see and then there's what we don't see. And I believe there's more to be seen than what's not seen than there is for the things that we just see. <laughs> in other words, this is God's plan to help bring his people hopefully in their hearts back to him. So he's, he's allowed this to happen. But even in what God has allowed to happen, how many of you know there is an enemy? And if you don't believe that, Jesus believed there was. So I completely believe there's an enemy. And the enemy loves to leverage culture as an agenda to get God out of us and to put the world in us. And if the enemy can do that, the enemy knows that it will cause us to compromise our faith. And so culture has an agenda, and I believe that. And so you're going to see that this is this real thing happening in the story, but there's also, there's also the, an evil, and the devil is at play leveraging culture as well. So as we see, I mean, it's real practical, honestly. We're going to see three marks that we see in the story of a shifting culture. And by the way, this isn't something that I think may happen someday here in America. No, it's already happened. We are living in it. We are living in a culture that the culture has an agenda, and it wants to take God out. It wants to put in the gods of the culture in. And so verse 7, it says this, the chief official gave them new names, and here's how it starts. He gives them new names. And names, to this day, I think, but back then especially, names were your identities. It's who you were. So the chief official gives them new names. And to Daniel, he gave the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. Now, if you're a mom and you're about to have a baby and you're looking for some names, there's a great list right there, okay? So, so hey, I remember being in middle school, y'all. I had no interest, no interest in the things of God. I had all interest in the things of Troy, doing what I want to do. And I was in choir. And I got kicked out later, but I will save that story for another day. I won't tell you why. But I remember being in middle school, the public school I went, learning a song about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And it went like this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to the fiery furnace were tossed. Everybody thought the end was near. But they had faith in the Lord above would come and save the day. And I could swear I heard the angels say, my God's going to come. My God's going to come. And everything's going to be all right, all right. So, so you clap for the chiefs. And you clap for the dumbest song you've ever heard in your life. Good, good on you. Okay. So, and then I got kicked out and... This is pretty much the end of my choir days. But maybe you've heard those names, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But maybe you didn't know those were, their, those were their Babylonian names. And it's really important to know that what is at play here, this is what the king wants to do, but I also believe this is what the enemy wants to do, wants to give them new names and wants them to be confused in their identity of who they really are. And I really think this is a playbook for you and I as followers of Jesus to be aware of the times in which we live. And Daniel's name is this. His name literally meant, God is my judge. 
but it's changed to Belteshazzar, which some scholars say is a female name, and it means Bel protect his life. In other words, get your God out and get this false God in. Hananiah means the Lord shows grace. Shadrach means command of Aku, which is their moon god, another Babylonian god. Mishael, who is like God? In other words, like there's no one like God. That was that's what his name meant. That was his identity. It was changed to Meshach, which means who is as Aku is. In other words, that God is not your God anymore. This Babylonian God is your God. Azariah, his name meant the Lord is my help. The Lord is my help. But Abednego, in which his name was changed, is servant of Nebo, which is another just a pagan, pagan God, Babylonian God. So the whole point here is the name of, of the true and living God is replaced by the names of the false gods of Babylon. And I think even more than that, the enemy wants to redefine their future. He wants to redefine our future. He wants us to be confused about our identity. So when culture shifts, we got to know who we are. You got to know who you are. Well, how do I know who I am? I'll tell you. God's word is in God's word is where we find out who we are. And, and I will tell you this. God made you on purpose for a purpose. He made you exactly the way you are on purpose for a person, every part of you. And we got to let the one who designed us define us. I think about Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. God says to the prophet Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. God says a person isn't a person outside of the womb. A person is a person inside the womb. In fact, even more than that, people that don't even exist yet, God has a purpose and a plan for them. He's a redeeming God with a plan of redemption. And so regardless of what the enemy, the devil, has told you, God created you, God designed you, and he's got a plan for you on this planet, whether you believe it or not, whether you know it or not. And I will say from my own personal experience, you don't really even know who you really are until you connect with the one who created you. Because when I was doing my own thing, living my own life, I was on a hunt grasping for who I was. And I never really understood who I was until I encountered God's grace and my creator. And then I began to understand, he's got me on this planet for a purpose. And I didn't really understand myself until I understand the one who made me has a plan for me. Which is, by the way, why we do growth track. And Growth Track isn't, isn't just some classes that we do because we know we need to have some system in church to help assimilate people. I mean, that's part of it. And, but Growth Track, really, honestly, I mean, they're having it like right now. If you ha haven't been a part of Growth Track and you're considering making Rock Hills your church home, then I hope you do. But it's really about first step is for you to figure out, man, is this church a fit for me? Is this, is this a church I want to be a part of? Is this a church family I want to I wanna join? Because God didn't create us to be attenders in his church plan. He created us to be members of a family. And so part of it is you get a chance to say, like, are they as crazy as I thought they were? And you get to figure out if this is a place where you're going to land. And we hope you do. I mean, I don't want to ever purposely run somebody off. But at the same time, we might not be a fit for you. But good news, we live in an amazing town where there are so many churches that love God and believe his word is true. And they might have a little different style or preference. But I think that's a good thing because it takes all of us for God's kingdom. And so I don't want you to go somewhere else. But if you're exploring, you might find, like, I don't like Troy. And then there's a lot of other good options out there. That's, that's kind of step one. And then step two is that they're talking about today is we want to help everyone find your purpose. Because God's gifted you. You may not believe it. You may not know it. But God has given you spiritual gifts. You may think, I thought he just gave them to some, but I got the short end of the stick on the gifts. Nope. God's given you gifts to be used on this planet. And one of the most amazing things is when we discover what they are so that we can make a difference with them. Either way, God wants us to understand who we are in him. And it is his word that gives us the framework of who we are. So Daniel 1.8, you know, they're going to force him to eat the food from the table. Daniel 1.8 says this, But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. In other words, Daniel had already pre-decided, everybody, let me say that again, he had pre-decided before he gets into a situation what his values and what his faith was. Because if you can pre-decide before the situation, you're more likely to hold on to your faith as opposed to trying to figure that out when you're in the situation. And his heart was resolute. He's like, man, I've got values and this, and from God's word, and this breaks my doctrine. And, and he was going to stand up for his faith. The culture will try to confuse your identity. And number two, it gets you to compromise your standards. I love what the Apostle Paul says. I think it's real practical. In Romans 12, 2, the Apostle Paul says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There's a difference between conforming and transforming. Conformers are people whose lives are controlled by the pressure from without. 
The transformers are people whose lives are controlled from the power from within. And we're going to see as we go through the story of Daniel and his friends that they were change agents that didn't conform to the pressures of the outside, but God gave them a power from within, and they actually transformed the pagan rulers around them to bring glory to God for God's will to be done. And I believe God wants to do that the same with us. He wants to use us and leverage us. And in fact, God wants us to be salt and light in our community. But if we're going to do that, we got to know who we are. we got to pre-decide because the first thing that they did is they were all in on who they were in faith as children of God. They were all in. And they had to be all in. In other words, they, they, couldn't, they couldn't change God's word to fit their lifestyle. They had to change their lifestyle to fit God's word. Because they knew it was God's word that, that revealed to them who they were. And who we are is found in God's word. And, and I know sometimes it's like, man, I, doesn't God just, that doesn't sound like always very exciting or lots of fun. But God, doesn't God want me to be happy? He doesn't want me to be happy? And the truth is that it's better than that. God wants you to be holy. And you can't be holy on your own. So what do we do? <laughs> That's a dilemma. Well, God has to do for you what you can't do for yourself. But if you trust in him, he'll set you apart for a special purpose, which is what it means to be holy. And then he wants you to be spiritually healthy. Because when you're holy and healthy by his power, it's way better than happy. Because happy's fleeting. Has anybody experienced that? Like when your football team doesn't win and then that screws up your whole weekend and happiness just grew wings and flew away? It's because it's circumstantial. But God wants to give you something that causes you to have constant joy regardless of your circumstances. And that's what he does when he helps us be holy and healthy, but we got to know who we are in God. we got to know what we believe. Now Joshua, I love what Joshua says. I won't read it all. I'll just say this, Joshua 24. He's talking to God's people. He says, now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of our ancestors, these false gods. You could throw those away. But he says, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, in other words, it's your choice. But if it seems undesirable to you, he says this, then choose for yourselves this day who you will serve. You've got to be resolute. You've got to pre-decide. Choose for yourself whether you're going to serve the gods of our ancestors, those false gods. Or you're going to, or he says this, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. He's resolute. All right, let's keep going on. I'm going to read verse 9, and Daniel says this. Now God had caused the official, that's Ashpenaz, uh, to show favor and compassion to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my Lord. He's afraid of Nebuchadnezzar because he has assigned your food and drink. And why, why should he see you, Daniel, and your friends looking worse than any other of the young men your age? Then the king uh, will have my head. In other words, if this doesn't work out and I do what you want me to do, Daniel and friends, he's going to cut my head off. That's pretty good incentive to carry out your job. I don't know. But um, then it says this, that Daniel then said to the guard, whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, and the, I love this. Please test your servants for 10 days. In other words, let's, let's make a deal. Let them test us and, and give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So the official, he agreed to this and he tested them for 10 days. Now, listen, uh, here's what I want you to know. This is like a food test. Okay, like it messes with our customary dietary kosher laws of being a Hebrew, and that breaks my value system, and I can't do that. I can't go there. And then he's like, well, the official's like, they're going to cut my head off if we don't work. He said, well, let's come up with a deal. Give us 10 days. Give us 10 days and see what happens. And it's called a test. But I don't know if Daniel and his friends realized that this food test was just one of many tests they were about to face. Y'all, listen, Daniel, if he's at 16, Scholars say it's somewhere around the age of in his 80s, which would have been 70 years, he was going to face test after test after test. And it wouldn't just be a food test. It would be facing death tests. Lots of them. I love the story about the fiery furnace and the lion's den. But, y'all, that was, I'm going to test you. I'm going to confront your faith. Culture is going to confront your faith. And I'm going to throw you in to see if you're, if you're going to withstand death. And how on earth did Daniel stand firm in his faith and love people well and not lose his influence is only by the grace of God. And that is the point. And if you and I are going to walk out this life of faith, we're going to have to have God's help for the same. And the rest of his story, and I hope you can be here next week, because next week we're going to learn like God is a God of destinies and dreams and there's interpretation. But in the midst of a crazy, chaotic world, the world is still in God's hands. And I think that's going to be relevant. 
And we're going to see the rest of the story, how Daniel stood firm and loved well at the same time. But today I want to end with this, because even as amazing as Daniel and his friends are, and these stories are incredible, Jesus embodies this like no one ever else in human history who did not lower the standard of God, yet loved like no one had ever loved before. Jesus is the one who embodied what it looks like to love people well and not lower the standard of God's truth. In fact, he lived it. John, who is said that he was like Jesus' beloved, he was super close, friend of Jesus, he says in John 1, 14, the word became flesh, talking about Jesus. It's what we celebrate at Christmas, that God sent his son, and he became a baby, put on flesh. The word became flesh, and then made his dwelling among us. For 33 years, Jesus lived a perfect, sinless life, made his dwelling among us. And then he says, John says this, we have seen his glory, and the glory of the one and only son, who came from the father, listen, listen, so huge, full of grace and truth. Grace and truth. And truth. Notice grace comes first. <laughs> I'm grateful for that. Grace and truth. But, but here's, here's, we're going to wrap up with this thought. Here's what our, I believe, me included, our human tendency, and definitely a lot of church history, is we go to the extremes of one or the other. Grace and truth, that's really hard. You're going to have to have the help of the Holy Spirit. To have both truth and grace. But what happens is a lot of times we either do one or the other. We either swing the pendulum over here. We're really good as human beings swinging the pendulum to the extremes. You ever notice that? We tend to live in the extremes. But that doesn't honor God. If you go to one extreme and it's all about truth, it's all about God's standard. Is there truth? Absolutely. Is there a standard that's holy, that is God's? Absolutely. But, but to camp over here where it's just about truth and not about grace ever means that you're more concerned about being right than you are relationship. And even when you are right, because maybe you are right, you're wrong in how you treat other people. And sometimes people stay in this camp of it's just truth. And listen, listen, what happens is when we go to the one extreme or the other, we either separate from culture or we assimilate to culture. And neither one of those honors God. And we're going to see in the story what does it look like to have both grace and truth. Because if you swing the pendulum the other way and it's all about grace and we love everybody and we accept everybody and we just let people do what they do and culture leads and we follow, we just got to love, then guess what happens is we assimilate to culture and we won't make a difference at all. And so it's so important that we have God's help in this journey to have both grace and truth. Truth is God's standard. God has a way. God has a standard. In Romans, we went through the book of Romans, and we said this, when I live my way instead of God's way, in any way, that sin, and my sin separates me from God. There is a standard. And the standard is we find in God's word. John 17, 17 says, sanctify them by the truth, your word is. It's truth. God's word is our standard. And you know what? We can't meet that standard on our own. Well, what? Well, why would God create a standard that nobody can meet? Which is the point of his son. Because his son came to do for us that which we cannot do for ourselves. Which is exactly what grace is. And grace is God's favor. And God's favor is when God does for us that which we can't do for ourselves. And the truth is, is that on the cross, Jesus paid for every mark that we couldn't hit. He did that for us. And Jesus is the embodiment of truth and grace. I love what it says in Ephesians. Paul says in chapter 2, God saved you by his grace, his unmerited favor when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. So we're going to talk about grace and truth. Standing firm in faith and loving well and being a difference maker in culture. Listen, Jesus called us to be salt and light. Salt is absolutely ineffective if it stays in the salt shaker. So we're not to separate from culture and build safe houses because salt doesn't do any good in the salt shaker. But salt, what it's meant to do is to prevent decay and make things better. And the only way that happens is when it mingles with the thing it's supposed to season. And then light, light helps point the way. And light, if you've ever been in dark in the woods and had a headlamp, then you know that light is most leveraged in the dark. <laughs> and Jesus calls us to be salt and light. And listen, truth without grace, that's just mean. 
And I don't think it's very effective. And even if you are right, maybe how you're presenting God's truth is wrong. If it's not effective. But grace without truth, well, that's meaningless. So we can't help take people to life change if there's not a standard called God's truth. But when we get truth and grace together, now that's meaningful. It's meaningful in our lives. It's meaningful to those that are around us. And then I want to close this with this thought. Grace invites us to be free. Grace is an invitation that I don't deserve and I didn't do anything to earn. And grace invites me to Jesus so that the truth can set us free. Grace invites us to be free so the truth can set us free. Truth is that truth and grace is a medicine that heals. And let me say this. God's plan of sending his son to die for us in our place, his plan following that was not for the purpose that people would get together in a building and attend church as religious people. That's not what he had in mind. What he did have in mind is that people would be so transformed by the kindness and grace of God that they begin to live out truth because of what Jesus had done for them. And then when they gather together, that's what church is. When you gather together in the name of Jesus, regardless of what surrounds you as a building, but when you gather together, that that place would be so full of truth and grace, it's like a hospital of healing. And some people just got in the hospital a little bit before the other people, but that's the only difference, everybody. Because some of you are like, man, I'm glad they're here today. I mean, they messed up and they need this. What, did you forget that we all messed up? If not for the grace of God, where would I be? And followers of Jesus never, ever forget. If not for God's grace, where would you go? And like you figured it out on your own? I don't think so. This is a place of healing and a place where it's a hospital where we are overwhelmed by the truth and grace of who Jesus is. And I have a dream. I'm not Martin Luther King Jr., as amazing as he was. But I do have a dream, but it's a little unrealistic without the help of God. But good news, God's willing to help us. And the dream is this, is that everyone's welcome. And that's not just something that you say. Like you really mean it. Everyone is welcome because we all messed up. But everyone's changed. Now, I know that's ideal. <laughs> and you live in a real world. And closing the gap between what's ideal and real is super hard. But by the grace of Jesus and the help of the Holy Spirit, we can close the gap between what is ideal and what's real. And this would be a place where everyone is welcome. But everyone has changed. His grace so changed my life that now I want to follow through with his truth. And that's what we get to do together. Let's pray. Father, I love you. I thank you for every person that's here today. I thank you for the truth that's found in your word. And Lord, I pray it would land in every heart today more than this story. But it would land, this is, I believe, what your Holy Spirit wants us to think about and process. Grace and truth. Grace and truth. How to live in the healthy tension. With your help, God, of grace and truth. And Lord, I pray for anybody here that has not yet put their faith in you today. Today would be that day. Your heads bowed and your eyes closed. If, if that's you and you're hearing about grace and truth, man, I just can't help but picture the cross. I mean, there's a cross holding a man of truth who had done nothing wrong. Holy, just, sinless, righteous. The righteousness of God, God himself. Hanging on a cross, that's grace. He didn't deserve to be there, but he's there for you. Giving his life for you because he loves you. He did for you what you can't do for yourself. And if you've never put your faith in that, today could be a day. And I just want to invite you, if you, if you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life and your Savior, I'm going to invite you to pray with me. And you just pray this. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son. Oh, Jesus, thank you for giving your life. Thank you, Lord, that you laid it down for me. Thank you for your grace that invites me and your truth that sets me free. And, Lord, I, in return for what you've done for me, I, if you're praying that right now, just tell them, I give you my life. I give you my life. You're worthy of it. I pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Rock Hills, would you celebrate those that just prayed that prayer, gave their hearts to Jesus? <laughs>